Now zip up your pants and get your shoes, and then let's get them on, huh? This is Bobby Tyler. He's five years old. His brother David is six. They're active youngsters, always into things. <laughs> you know better than to jump on the furniture. Sit down. Like many brothers, they like to horse around. That is not a skateboard. It is two. Now, they may seem like typical kids, but every morning before going to school, Bobby and David are given a drug to control their behavior. Because they're called hyperactive. Today, hyperactivity is the most common behavior disorder of childhood. Experts estimate 3 to 20 percent of school-aged children are hyperactive. Eight out of nine are boys, and as many as 500,000 children are on stimulant-like drugs. Yet confusion and controversy surround what hyperactivity is and how to treat it. I don't think it's fair to a child to put medication in his body that's not necessary. He can solve it otherwise. Medication makes the brain function better. Then they just started calling me pillhead and hypo and MR. And, you know, I didn't know what MR meant and EH. My reaction when somebody says there's no such thing as a hyperactive child is Come and walk five miles in my shoes, Buster, and it'll make you a believer. Well, my feeling is that hyperactive children, what they call hyperactive children, are not any different than any other children. They're just more so. As the term hyperactivity is generally used, it's not a precise medical diagnosis like cerebral palsy. Rather, it's a description of behavior based mostly on subjective reports from parents and teachers. And sometimes it's hard to tell where normal ends and hyperactive begins. This is Alan. He's in a special preschool for hyperactive children. His doctor says Alan's the most hyperactive child he's ever seen. He has a short attention span, is uncoordinated, impulsive, and emotional. Most children called hyperactive are of average or above average intelligence. Many are imaginative, creative, and have a good sense of humor. But they sometimes perform below their ability in school, partly because they're easily distracted. Doctors say they're not more active than their normal peers. They're just active at the wrong time or the wrong place. The wrong place is often the classroom, and it's at school that the labeling process usually begins. I want you outside now, Alan. Go outside until you're ready to come in and take care of your job. A San Francisco pediatrician receives one or two calls a week from schools to treat children with drugs. Uh, very frequently, it's not a question of if we agree there's a fair amount of pressure from the schools for these children to be put on medication to uh, treat their hyperactivity. And maybe of the 60 to 70 referrals we get from the schools a year, we're finding that we have to treat possibly three to four a year. And the majority of the other children may be distractible in school, may not be learning well, but we do not feel that they have true hyperactivity syndrome, that there are some other outside influences that are causing their difficulties. Hyperactive behavior is complex because it has many causes, usually more than one in each child. But often, it's treated simplistically with drugs. Even though the problem may not be in the child's body alone, but in his home, school, or environment. The use of drugs in a small Southern California town has focused national attention on how hyperactivity is treated. The controversy in Taft began when the schools received federal money for a special program. Its purpose was to find out why some children couldn't learn. Richie Robinson was one of those children. Two years ago, Richie's first grade teacher said he was hard to handle and couldn't sit still. The school doctor then diagnosed him hyperactive. She prescribed a drug called Ritalin to calm him down. But when Richie moved to another town, his new teacher said that he was a normal little boy who didn't need drugs. Today, Richie's mother says the problem was a first grade teacher who couldn't handle her son. To me, he wasn't hyperactive. He was just like any normal little boy with lots of energy. I mean, I went through it when I was a kid. I was out on the farm and running, playing, and that's how he was. 
Another boy in TAF, James Schaefer, is now an eighth grader. Four years ago, he too was diagnosed hyperactive and put on Ritalin. Today, James's parents say the school overlooked the real reason for James' hyperactive behavior. James was having trouble at school because of my illness. I'd been laid up quite severely, paralyzed down one side, and I'd lost a lot of my memory. And he was come home from school while he had to behave and be a good little kid at home. So he was taking a lot of his anxieties out at school. He was blowing off his steam at school. Now 18 parents have filed a lawsuit against the Taft School District. They claim they were pressured by teachers and principals into giving their children drugs as a condition for attending school. The purpose of the suit was to stop drugging children in schools. Without a proper neurological or psychological evaluation, they were just handing out pills. And to us, it was just saying, here, kids, take these pills. It's OK. Parents allege some of the children suffered weight loss, sleeplessness, and depression after several months on Ritalin. If they had have told me then of the side effects, or if I had have known then what would have happened when I took him off of it, I would have never put him on it. Lawyers for the Taft School District have advised their clients not to comment on the suit. The Taft case illustrates how concerned parents are that children are being inappropriately diagnosed and treated for hyperactivity. Journalists Diane Devoki and Peter Schrag spent two years researching their book, The Myth of the Hyperactive Child. They say the use of drugs to treat hyperactivity is a means of social control. But what has happened is that all kinds of kids who do things that teachers and other people don't like uh, are being described as having this medical problem called hyperactivity or hyperkinesis. And this is pretty much a way of, rather than saying that they're bad kids or disruptive kids, ordinary kids, of saying that they have a medical problem that you can treat medically, which the schools are now seeing as, as a benign way of treating it, um, which we don't. Dr. Henry Rickenbach is a pediatrician and consultant at Stanford University's Learning Problems Clinic. Well, the term hyperactivity, from originally having a fairly narrow description of organically brain-injured children, has become extended so widely that I think most of us are almost afraid to use the term anymore. It has come to describe children uh, who are busier than the people around them want or then serves their own purposes in school or in family. Hyperactivity has become a popular term that's misunderstood. Unqualified people are mistakenly assuming that any overactive child has brain damage. And that's what happened to Paul Stubbs. The day I picked Paul up from his first day of preschool, the teacher greeted me with a very concerned look on her face. She said, Mrs. Stubbs, I would like to talk to you alone. I walked into her room, she closed the door, and she stared at me straight in my face and said, I truly believe Paul has brain damage. I kind of gasped and was very upset and um, asked her why she said that. She said he was running all over the room. Only a small percent of children called hyperactive have known brain damage, and only a small percent like Paul have the inner driven metabolic disorder known as constitutional hyperactivity. Yet roughly 10% of school-aged children are called hyperactive. I don't look. You're not gonna eat breakfast either? Bob and Joanne Tyler have five children. Three years ago, a doctor told them that Bobby, age five, and David, six, were hyperactive. They were climbing over the backs of chairs, falling on the floors, running up and down the hall, screaming, acting totally out of control. The difficulties raising David began at birth. From the start, Joanne had to cope with a baby that left her exhausted. David cried the first three, four months of his life. He never shut up. We got maybe two hours sleep a night if we were lucky. David had respiratory problems as a baby and had to be given extra oxygen. His doctor says this may have predisposed him to hyperactivity. For Bobby, there weren't any medical complications. His mother thinks that his hyperactivity is hereditary. I'm going to give you a big boot right in your butt. How's that? 
Probably Bob and I together having children, that would sure do it because Bob is a very over-energetic person, and so am I. Hyperactivity tends to run in families. Experts say activity levels may be passed on genetically, but the home environment itself can also make a child act hyperactive. The children's current doctor thinks Bobby is reacting to a rambunctious older brother and a loosely structured home. He doesn't think either child should be on medication. Well, if he can find a new set of parents, send them over. And we'll see how long they last, because I think without the medication, he's going to, one, be in that hospital a lot of time with the kids, and two, going to have to find new parents every week. Now, quit it. That's enough. Now, knock. One of the main things about this is that it was so hard on the marriage. It came to the point of almost breaking it up. You don't have any time for each other. You're constantly chasing kids and you don't have any choice in the matter. You have to do it, or they hurt themselves. Joanne resisted putting her children on medication until the day they nearly died from inhaling insecticide. At that point in time, doctor uh, at the hospital that treated them in this emergency said, why aren't these kids on medication? What's the matter with you? And I told him I really, really hated the thought of putting my kids on medication, and we'd been trying a lot of different things, diets and all this. And he said, uh, why chase a dead horse? So the kids finally went on the medication. Three times a day, the children take Ritalin to control their behavior. Drugs like these are the treatment of choice for hyperactive children. Doctors don't know exactly how these stimulant-like drugs work, nor do they know what the long-range effects may be. Bobby did not grow in one period. It was a six-month period. He came off Ritalin for three months. He went from a size four clothing to a size six. Had he not been checked so closely, he may have gone on with not growing and been a size four until he was eight years old. Stimulant-like drugs can cause growth delay, loss of appetite, depression, and nausea. But doctors don't always warn parents of side effects, and they don't always follow up after prescribing. Ritalin is not recommended for children under six, but Bobby and David have been on it since they were three and four. Take it. Now, come on, be a big boy. If you can't take your pill like a big boy, then you're not a big enough boy to go with Daddy anymore. Yes, I am. Then take your pill. David. <laughs> do you want Mama I don't to like pills. Do you want Mama to spank you? I don't like pills. Some children don't like taking their medication. Like it makes them feel they're not in control. It makes them feel different. And children need to feel they're like other children. A cup. Because if you don't take the pill, the next time you want me to do something for you, I'm not going to do it. Now, I want you to do this for me, just so do it. It got to the point, and I think it does with most parents, whether they admit it or not, that you resent that kid so much because he takes so much out of you, okay. that you don't know which, what to do. And it's hard to say, boy, I don't like that kid or I hate that kid, but I think it's a natural feeling. You do. If something keeps going long enough and tries your patience hard enough, you do. You still love them, but it's a love-hate. This was mine. Thank you. If I get sick, now, don't you feel better? Drink. No! He takes 10 milligrams now. He is not as well behaved as he was on 15, but I can live with 10 milligrams in his behavior. Bobby is on 5 milligrams three times a day, and I can live with that. And I think that's the important thing. It's what's okay for the kid, and you can hack it, you know. You've got a little bit of help, and you know what's there. Bobby and David will go off Redlin for the summer. Their new doctor would like to keep them off. He's recommended parental guidance instead of medication. Don't let all that girl chase you out of school, either. Drugs are often the only treatment for hyperactive children, even though studies show they're ineffective alone. Dr. Leon Ettinger, hyperactivity expert. If the child needs tutoring, drugs aren't going to teach him. He's got to be tutored. If the family need 
help in handling the child, they're going to need some psychiatric or family counseling. If the child is having a lot of problems interpersonally, he may need either individual or group therapy. If he's got some real problems that you need to stop quickly, behavior modifications may be used, but you treat the whole child. I would reject completely the idea that drugs will do the whole job and that one should rely on them alone. Th this I would object to violently. Until recently, little research was done on what caused hyperactivity. Historically, it's been treated primarily with drugs. In the 1930s, doctors discovered that amphetamines had a calming effect on brain-injured children who were hyperactive. By the early 70s, stimulant-like drugs were being widely promoted in pediatric journals to treat behavior problems not related to brain injury. The message was minimal brain dysfunction. The MBD child was assumed to have something subtly, unexplainably wrong with his central nervous system. Drugs were supposed to correct a chemical imbalance in the brain. Today, the neurological explanation for hyperactivity is considered only one possibility. There are many others. Is still here. She sat on... Todd Longo isn't on medication anymore. Today, he's doing well in his second grade class. But just a few years ago, he was described as distractible and hard to control. His pediatrician says Todd had a complicated problem. He was born after a long and difficult labor. He was jaundiced at birth and still suffers from a number of allergies. All of these are considered possible contributors to hyperactivity. But he wasn't a behavior problem until he started school. And that was the same year that its parents moved to California. Two years later, they divorced. The root word? Bro. Mm -hmm. Bro, good. Okay. Todd's teacher, Mrs. Levinson, has taught Sherry? in the public schools for over 20 years. She thinks that children like Todd are influenced by the way we live. Oh, we find many more hyperactive kids, children that can't sit and listen to a story. They, many of them don't listen to each other. Certainly, there's a lot of pressure um, put upon them to succeed early. They really are anxious, and I think they reflect parents that are anxious because of moves or emotional problems, a lot of time commitments. Things just aren't relaxed and calm like they used to be. Todd's pediatrician, Dr. Sheldon Gross, agrees. Again, this is another family that is involved in our mobile society. This was a... This was a, a, a family where the father was working extremely hard. He had long hours, late hours, wasn't home much of the time. His mother, his wife had to do most of the rearing. So you can see that this particular case brings in the emotional, the environmental, uh, and actual physical findings in a child with true hyperactivity. And he, in fact, had a good response to medical management with drugs. Show it to... No, I Todd was one of the few children that Dr. Gross has treated with medication. His mother says it did some good. It helped Todd experience what it felt like to be calm. But she didn't like the effect Ritalin had on him. When I looked at Todd, I didn't see Todd. There was nothing left of Todd when he was under the influence of Ritalin. He was a completely different little boy. He was like little Lord Fauntleroy, just sat there, looked around. Well, that's fine, except that's not my son. Hi, honey. That's right. How are you? Both of them. You brought both your hats home today. Boy, you're really getting good. And can you deliver blood for me? Can I deliver blood? Yeah. We need all of our own blood. After Todd went on to medicine and we found one that, that we were comfortable with, um, Todd himself noticed that he was behaving better. He wasn't getting in trouble in kindergarten or nursery school as often as he was before. And he was, you know, coping better. And every morning he would remind me to give him his good boy pill. That's what he called it, was his good boy pill, because he knew he was a better behaved child. So um, I didn't like that, because I wanted him to learn, and I talked to him, and I wanted him to learn that it's him, that him... From inside, he has to learn to cope with himself, and that the medicine is an aid, not a crutch. And that eventually he was not going to be taking the pill, but we were going to expect him to behave himself anyway. And that the, 
when he started calling it his good boy pill, it occurred to me that he wasn't going to ever try to do it by himself, that he thought the medicine was everything. So at that point, we, we started working with the fact that he could do it himself if he really tried. Todd has been off medication for more than six months. His life is stabilized. He has a supportive, structured environment at school and now at home, too. He's still an emotional, restless child, but his mother thinks that's just his nature. Society says that these children are hyperactive. I just think that they're more active than some children. Hyperactive sounds like a disease. And I don't think because my little boy laughs easier or cries easier or sits less amount of minutes in a row altogether makes him ill. You know, I just think that he's a little bit more high strung, a little bit more emotional than some other children are. To me, he's a seven year old boy that has to learn. It's going to be a little harder for him to learn to be in a peg. If physicians would look at the total picture, we would probably be giving less drugs to our so-called hyperactive kids and looking into many of the other factors that are producing the syndrome. When Scott Bauer was having trouble in school a few years ago, his doctor and teacher wanted to put him on drugs, but his mother found out about a special diet and tried that instead. For a year and a half now, the Bowers have been on a diet that eliminates food with artificial colors, flavors, or preservatives. The theory is these substances trigger a chemical reaction causing behavior problems in people with a certain genetic profile. Phyllis Bauer says the diet is easy and inexpensive to prepare, and she says it's changed Scott's personality. Scott! What? Come here! Life has just become a lot easier. He's cooperative, helpful. Loves to help me, you know, do the dishes or cook meals. Wants to help me make the beds. Could I do this? Could I do that? Just is really cooperative. I ask him to change his clothes. He'll do it before I would even ask him because he'd just get into a big fight about it. And now I, I can see that it wasn't the way I was treating him any differently than his brother. It was just a case of chemicals entering into his body and making him unable to control himself. Phyllis says she can tell whenever Scott goes off his diet. We had some apple pie on a Sunday night, and on Monday he was having troubles at school. And I've had three parent-teacher conferences this week due to this, well, I thought it was the apple pie. Now, I don't know if it's the apple pie or the cookie from the neighbor's house that did it, but he's most uncooperative at school. So he was reacting to something he had no control over. Some doctors and psychiatrists are skeptical. The diet alone can have so much effect on a child. They say part of the reason the diet seems to work is that the child is suddenly getting attention he never had before. The effectiveness of the diet is currently being researched. Recent studies show it works for only a small percentage of hyperactive children, but more and more families like the Bowers are willing to try the diet before putting their children on drugs. Dr. Benjamin Feingold, the allergist who pioneered the diet theory. We're in a drug culture now, where we have millions and millions of children. It's a way of life. As soon as a child's not doing well at school, you put them on Ritalin and amphetamine and they got the drugs. That's the fad. And we have never looked at food as a cause of behavior or mental disturbances. We've never looked at nutrition as a cause of behavior. It's only one aspect of it. There's no simple solution to hyperactivity because there are so many possible causes, usually more than one in each child. Experts say effective treatment means looking at all of the causes. In Escondido, California, there's a federally funded preschool for children diagnosed hyperactive. Now, this pilot program is designed to treat the whole child through a variety of teaching and counseling techniques. Teacher Sandy Weir runs a highly organized class, emphasizing structure and individual attention. And an early intervention program would hopefully intervene specific learning problems that a child might develop because of a short attention span, because of the problems in social development, and because of the low frustration tolerance that a child would have. To build confidence and lengthen attention span, children first learn to succeed at short tasks and then go on to longer ones. Activities are planned to meet the strengths and the weaknesses of each child. There are exercises to develop coordination and to learn the socially accepted ways of handling problems. 
Sheila started to grab that, right? Aye. Instead of saying, no, why don't you say, Sheila, I can do it myself. Oh, I always do. Can you tell Sheila that? She don't want to hold me. You want her to help you, or do you want to do it alone? I want to do it alone. All right, then tell her. Say, I'll do it alone, Sheila. I don't know him, Sheila. Okay, fine. Being unable to communicate what you want or too uncoordinated to get it, always hearing no's and don'ts and doing poorly in school, all make life very frustrating for the child called hyperactive. It's also hard on the parents. He just couldn't fit in up there at the school he was going to. Just, they would have put him, passed him through kindergarten, put him in the first, and then he probably would have flunked that too. Once a week for eight weeks, parents of the preschoolers get together for a positive parenting group. The idea is to build structure and consistency at home as well as at school. Some parents learn they've expected too much from their child for his age. And he came home and I said, did you give your snack money to Sandy? He said, no. And I said, why not? And he said, uh, because uh, we put it in a hole in the window of the bus and we couldn't get it out. And I said, who's we? He said, Sheila and me. And I said, your money is still on the bus? Yes. And I go to school the next day and find out that Sandy did get the note and she did get the snack money. From Jason. Uh -huh. From Jason. So where did this <laughs> hole in the bus come from? <laughs> I think fantasy is fun. And I think pretend stories are fun. And a lot of children who have vivid imaginations really enjoy telling stories. And so I don't know that at three years old, I would say that that was lying. Put my feet. <laughs> what are these? Doctors say that active, impulsive behavior is typical for a three to five-year-old. There's a good chance the label hyperactive doesn't apply at such an early age. But in order to get funds for special classes, schools must label children. So they play an important role in the increasing number of children called hyperactive. When Victor Cunningham was a little boy, there were no special classes for children Second. called hyperactive. When I was in third grade, they said, here comes bad news, Cunningham. They said, the problem child. They sent notes home to my mother that I was a problem child. Get your banjo out. Fifteen years ago, the hyperactive child might simply have been called a bad boy. Today, instead of getting expelled, he's seen as a child who needs help. But in trying to help him, have we gone too far? By seeing the problem in the child's body alone, a simple solution becomes the treatment of choice. The child described as hyperactive has many possible reasons for his behavior, just like any other child. He deserves to be treated as a whole. His parents, teachers, and doctors are all responsible for seeing that he is. Good boy, sit down. Victor! Oh, my God. Victor. Oh, my God. Victor. Oh, my God.